Okay. Okay. Welcome everybody to the, I don't know, like seventh, eighth, what is this, August? This is the eighth uh, Sydney lecture. And um, doing one myself, finally. So um, I'm originally planned these, I think, as I've mentioned to a lot of people, to be sort of like classes as an opportunity for people to be able to take a class with people who they would never get to take a class with because they're in some other country or they're in some other location. And there's a horrible glare. Yeah, I know, I always get that. Okay. And uh, sorry, I've tried to fix this light and get this. Oh, uh, anyway, so, uh, you know, so when I tell people to think about the lectures, I tell them, think about it as a class that you're going to teach, where uh, it's not just a lecture, it's not just about coming in and talking to us, it's about being interactive and trying to work with people. The problem is that, you know, I don't know, we've got a, a nice group of people here, uh, 12, 15 people or something. I don't actually expect that everyone here has done the readings, and I don't actually think you have to have done the readings to want to come and sit in on this. Like I you know, would love to just have been able to sit on some talk by somebody that I read their work and I thought, oh my God, it'd be so cool to sit and listen to them teach a class or something. So uh, there's a, a toss up between how much of this is lecture and how much of this is a classroom. So I'm gonna try to make it, I think, um, on the more interactive side, but I'm gonna spend the first part, like I wouldn't any class or of setting things up and talking about the idea. And then I'm going to go work through some of the concepts with you. And then um, near the end, we'll then work through the readings and talk about the readings. Normally, again, in a class, I would start with the readings. I'd do an intro, start with sort of the oldest reading first, work up my way through the readings. And then um, we'd have a discussion about different things after that. So it'll be, I think, something along those lines. Uh, it, I'm going to, normally I'm running the camera sort of as the facilitator, somebody else is speaking and I try to uh, change the window size and stuff to make it um, easy to see who's speaking and to make it easy to see the notes. So I'm doing all that myself. Uh, so I, I decide I'm not gonna try to stream this. Richard, I was gonna stream this one live on Facebook. I'm gonna wait till the next one. We may have, uh, we may trade out Josh Bentley for Bob Heath next month. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. Bob says he's willing to go in February, but he also was ready to go today if I had asked him to. So I thought, why don't we have Bob follow this up? Because Bob wants to do a talk on the history of public relations. So I'm going to spruik Bob for just a second and, and talk about, uh, um, I think we'll have him go next week. And I think it will be actually quite a, an interesting talk because Bob's one of the you know older people in the field. I think he said he's 78 now. And so he's, uh, he knows the history of the field and what's happened over the last several dec decades. So I think we're going to have Bob next on that. All right. So with that, I'm going to get started. I'll do the typical share screen and um, put up my notes on the side here. And uh, if you want to ask a question, as a reminder, uh, you can hit the shift button on your, or, or sorry, hit the space bar, and that will temporarily unmute you if you want to make a comment. Because uh, often when I'm muted, I forget, I'm, you know, everybody does, and we're like, no, we can't hear you. So uh, I like to remind everybody, if you hit the space bar, it'll temporarily unmute you. And um, sorry, you have to see my ugly desktop. Somewhere here I have my slides. Okay. So I want to get started with uh, talking about, let me just make sure everybody can see this, right? Everybody's got a view of my desktop. You can see these notes over here. Okay, I got a head nod from Kim. Okay, and let me just set this up so we can see more people about who's here if you're spectating. All right, so basically, like I said, I wanna start us off talking about some of the big picture stuff. Um, my, originally, I thought of this as, you know, like, can we do it as teaching people to do theory? And as I started thinking about it, I realized, you know, like, to do theory, you gotta understand theory. There's no, like, 10 tips for writing a theory article. So uh, I wanna take us through the basic principles here first. So on the most basic level, scholars uh, have different interests and diff ask different questions. You know, why, does everyone, why doesn't everyone do theory? And this first question is just that we all have different interests. And so there are many people who wanna answer specific questions. They might not have a theory interest in terms of what they do, and that's okay. Everyone doesn't have to do theory, but that's one of the first things to consider is it depends what you want to do. What is it you're trying to answer? And then the second question here, 
applied research seeks to solve problems to build theory. Many people, again, aren't interested in theory necessarily. They're interested in something um, applied. They want to answer a question. They want to solve a problem. And uh, just a second, I'm going to have to get a Kleenex here in a second. Maureen, if you're still on, could you grab me a Kleenex, please? Uh, <laughs> I will. <laughs> Uh, all right, so uh, if you're trying to answer an applied problem, if you're trying to solve an issue, <laughs> Dale, it's getting me a clear next. All right. Uh, Thank you. Yes, I, I, it's killing me. Hold on a second. That was the high one. I want to be on the lowest. There you go. That's the lowest. It's, think... still, it's still bad. It's still a glare. Okay, sorry. All right, where are we? All right, so anyway, uh, and that's also fine. It's not that you, you know, have to do theory, but if you're trying to solve a problem, you're not necessarily going to be studying theory. Third question, third issue here, most scholars are probably not interested in theory or do not think about theory because they weren't trained to. If you didn't come from a background where you wrote papers about theory, where you, you were a critical thinker, where not that you're not critical, but that you came from, say, a rhetorical background or a critical background where you were taught to question ideas, to question the concepts. So when I read a theory in graduate school by somebody else, I didn't think, oh, this is great. I want to use this to study something. I thought, oh, they totally are wrong here. Or why did they do that? They don't understand this point. And so the initial response, I think, for people who are trained to think about that is to see it as um, how can we improve that? Or how is that theory, you know, is that a good theory? Not so much as a way of a tool to use to study something. And so I think it's a different mindset. And I think we can get into it. If you're not necessarily a theoretical thinker, you can start moving towards that. And then this fourth issue here is occupational psychosis, which is related to what I said before. We think about the world in terms of how we were trained to do it. If your professor taught you to do network analysis, then you see things often as, as networks, as you know, relationships between groups and organizations and individuals and processes. And you might not uh, necessarily immediately default to saying, um, what's the reason for this? Is the theory accurate? All right, so then the second, se second issue here, why should public relations scholars care about theory? I said before, you don't have to necessarily, but I think this first point is actually something I tell, I always tell young scholars and graduate students when I'm talking to them is that from a career standpoint, theory is what gets you cited, okay? If you write a theory piece, it's likely if 100 people study that thing and you write a piece that informs that thing, you're gonna get 100 citations. If you're one of those 100 people studying 100 different things or even 50 different things, you might get three citations. And so when you contribute to theory, you not only advance the field, but you also raise the chance professionally that you're gonna get, your work will get used. And I know that's somewhat strategic and I don't think about things like, oh, I hope I get a lot of cites for that. Um, but at the same time, if you can contribute to the theoretical thinking in an area, you should. You, can, you should help build it. All right. Second thing here is as you become immersed in a body of research, you should begin to ask more sophisticated questions. A, a, in, a beginning graduate student will find it difficult to enter into a theoretical discussion or debate about something because you don't have the background yet. You don't know what's been said before. You don't know all the pieces that have been written. And importantly, you don't necessarily know about a bunch of other theories or ideas or concepts to turn to when you want to uh, extend or question something, when you want to ask about it. And so um, that's another issue is just that it'll, it, in theory, it'll come to you with time where you'll start realizing there are questions I want to ask about this concept. The third is um, Fred. And I talk about Fred from time to time, but not enough, I think. There's a great piece I'm happy to send you. It's in a chapter by uh, Knight. Uh, it's in the bibliography at the end. And it's, it's from a book called like How to Write Short Fiction or something like that. And he has this metaphor of Fred. And Fred is sort of your unconscious mind who um, works out problems for you when you're sleeping and when you're not thinking about it. And I've actually, over the last probably probably seven or eight, six or seven years maybe, given myself over to Fred. And Fred will solve your problems. I know it doesn't make sense yet. You need to read about it. But, but Fred, you, you, you just tell Fred, like, I need to figure out how to start this presentation. And then it will just come to you. Stop worrying about it. You know, go to bed, have some beers, you know, hang out with your mates. 
and uh, tomorrow, the next day, the next week, Fred will have a solution for you. And it really is real, so you can you know, read about psychology if you want to understand it. But my point here is that um, part of the process of, being, of learning how to deal with theories is to just think about them. And you don't have to be sitting there concentrating, trying to like think of something new. Just, just get it into your head and have it, you know, banging around so that, you know, when you're, when you're going to sleep, you start thinking about a couple of those concepts and then go to sleep on them. And I know from doing this with woodworking and other things that you'll come up with a solution. You don't know how to do it today, but in a week or a month, you'll suddenly wake up and say, I know how to do that. I know how to do that thing. So I'm throwing that out there. Read the, read the piece by night if you want to. I think you'll find it useful. Okay, then I've already, I think, said this. To understand theory, we need to understand the process. And everyone took a communication theory class, or, or probably did, or has read a, a, something about communication theory. But I think in a lot of cases, we have trouble with um, what some of these concepts mean. So I want to start with one. Uh, I want to start with our question about what is an epistemological question. How do we know things? So I have this question here about what are the sources of knowledge? I actually should have told you to go get a piece of paper first so that you can take notes if you don't have one. Go ahead and run and get one. But basically, I want you to make a list real quick. You know, two minutes. I'm actually going to go grab a cup of tea real fast. Take two minutes and make a list of how do we know things, okay? What are all the different ways that we know things? This is, like I said, epistemology. Uh, this you know, study of knowledge. How do we know things? Make a list of that. I'll be right back. And I want to put that together real quick. What? How do we know things? How do we know things? Uh, you tell me. Are they talking? Think about that for a second. Are you muted or are you on? Okay, Warren is very agitated about the light. I think this has helped a little bit, maybe made it worse, I'm not sure. So, I know it's probably only a minute, but you should already have a bunch of things. So how do we know things? I'll answer. I, I didn't get as many as your list, Michael, but uh, I, I might start us off because I guess other people will be able to expand on it. Okay. But uh, I had four broad categories, uh, scientific methods, uh, and in parentheses, both qualitative and quantitative, uh, lived experience, um, what we used to call anecdotal evidence, but lived experience is all the rage, of course, uh, phenomenological approaches, and, uh, and, and secondary research, just, you know, reading books and that sort of stuff. And that's where I finish my list. Phenomenological experience. All right. And, and the third one was, what did you say, reading? Yeah, secondary research or meta-analysis, if we want to be fancy. Okay. Oh, uh, it's the space, because I'm thinking I can spell most things. All right, secondary. Okay, good. What else we got? Something different, something new. I use different words to Mitchell. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what do we got? Um, observation. Uh, what else have I got? Uh, empirical experience, fiction. <laughs> History. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. Others? Uh, anybody else? Jump in. I said authority because someone told me that this is the, the way it is. Then okay. also intuition that because I have a feeling that's how it's supposed to be. 
Okay. Uh, then, so. then logic, um, because like kind of rational thinking, that's how it should be. Uh, and I mean, I have added this as well, um, kind of common knowledge, something you don't want to question. Culture. Something, culture, common knowledge, tradition, something you don't even question as you, you, you're taking it for granted. So okay. kind of, that, yeah, culture, I don't know. Yeah, something that you have brought up with. Right. Now we could we could keep going and make this list bigger. Um, I actually just did eleven because I have eleven on my list. But let's skip down for a second then and look at this. So if we look at these, we hit on most of these, but we may not necessarily hit on all of them. But we've got aesthetics, the experiential things we have from seeing beauty, from seeing things. We've got cognition, which is um, you know related to science and reasoning. We've got culture and uh, cultural experiences. We've got empirical um, ways of knowing things. We've got hermeneutic uh, experiences where we interpret and we analyze ourselves and try to make sense of things. We've got extrasensorial, whether you believe in ESP or not. There is the sense that um, we might, you know, maybe it is sensorial, but some people are able then to, to experience things in different ways than other people. We've got logic, of course, and reasoning and, and social traditions, spiritual, uh, whether you believe or not, you know, the, I, one of the things I noticed with my students this recent semester is they had the, uh, one of them had uh, the Atheists Organization of Australia as an organization for their activity. And they really had difficulty struggling with it because the atheists often treat themselves like a religion. You know, they're sort of against everyone else and they want to talk about their, how their beliefs are better and stuff. And it's really just sort of, you know, a religion in itself. And so there are believers who have certain senses of how the world is and how things work because of their, their ideology. But then there are people who say they have no belief, but also have, you know, sort of baggage. So you have that, and then you have the sensorial, right? And there are more than that. But the point is just that, first off, the way we know things is very broad. So when we think about, when we're thinking about theory, we realize that there isn't going to be just one way, you know, like there's the scientific method and there's, um, empirical approaches to how we study things, but there's a lot more to it than that. So I'm um, going to shrink this window back down again. I had to make it bigger because I heard Anna, but I couldn't find her and get her on my screen there. So I was getting uh, freaked out trying to figure out where she was. All right. So um, this is something I know that many people struggle with, even, even professors, you know, who've been working with this for a long time. Theologies, okay? Epistemology, ontology, axiology. This is in many ways the basis of theory, okay? Everyone, I think, knows these concepts, has heard of them, and I think epistemology is probably the easiest of them. That was what we were just sort of talking about, right? Epistemology, branch of philosophy that studies knowledge, how people come to know what they claim they know. And there are certain kinds of uh, questions that we ask uh, epistemological questions. So to what extent can knowledge exist before experience? There, we, we have this with language, right? Does thought precede language or does language come before, you know, does language influence thought? How can we have language if we don't have thought, but then we know that language is, is part of how we think. So we have certain kinds of chicken and egg questions that are part of this, but how, uh, the extent to which knowledge can exist before experience, to what extent can knowledge be certain or absolute? And we know that there are various theories that, that the people who espouse them are quite sure that they are absolutely true. I sat next to a scholar a number of years ago at an intercultural panel, and they insisted that the excellence theory was absolutely correct, and we didn't need any other theories to make sense of the field. And um, they were quite confident in that. And I, was, and I asked, well, we're on an intercultural panel, you know, like the assumption is that they have other ideas, and they just were confident that it didn't matter, that there was only one that mattered. So there's this sense of absolute knowledge, or I think in some ways smugness, that comes with some epistemological stances. And then what, by what process does knowledge arise? And that's an important question. Do we learn it culturally? Do we learn it interactively? Do we learn it by thinking about things? Do we learn it in dreams? Is knowledge best understood in parts or as a whole? And to what extent is knowledge explicit? So these, this is your is epistemological assumptions about how we know things. Then the second bigology that you probably are familiar with is, 
is the ontology, right, or axiology, whichever one you want to look at, branch of philosophy that deals with the nature of being. And this is the one I think that, empir that empiricists and um, epistemology has a big trouble with, because ontology is about experience. It's about lived experience. You can, uh, I can describe love to you, and I can tell you that when you're in love, you have certain uh, you know, responses that, you're, that you might experience and you might have a, you know, increased heart rate and you might have you know, other kinds of you know, pupil dilation. That doesn't explain to you what it means to when you see someone suddenly and you feel for them. And this doesn't have to be in any kind of sexual way, just the attraction we have to somebody smart or somebody funny or somebody friendly. That's not something we can quantify in any meaningful way. So when we talk about ontology, we're asking questions like, to what extent do humans make real choices? You know, is it because of, you know, biology or is it because of, of, you know, society that we act the way we do? That might be a question that someone asks, but from an ontological standpoint, we want to ask, how do we make choices? Is human behavior best understood in terms of states or traits? Is human experience primarily individual or social? And we can look at both. Again, if you turn to, I used, uh, I used the Little John and, and Foss, originally it was Little John, when I was an undergraduate, Little John must be a thousand years old. Uh, but I used his book when I was an under, undergraduate, and now it's in like the 11th edition or something. And uh, the text, you know, the text is all about communication theory, and there's, I have never counted, 150, 250 theories in the book. So, I mean, there's lots of different theories out there. So when we ask, is experience uh, individual or social or public, these are, we know that there are, it depends what question you ask, where you're standing. And then the last, to what extent is communication contextual? So this is an ontological orientation, which is different. And then finally, axiology. I think this is the one most people find the, the most tricky. Branch of philosophy concerned with the study of values. Without values, uh, what values guide our research, et cetera. So can theory be value free? This is the sense that, you know, knowledge, that science is, um, is, is not ethical or unethical, we're just studying phenomenon. But if you're studying, um, you know, the propensity of someone for violence, and you, you know, you let your research take you into saying it's a racial issue, or it's a cultural issue, or it's a something else issue, you can pretend that your research is value free, but it's not. Your research is going to have implications on, on people. And the same thing for people studying, uh, in studying uh, IT, and, uh, or, uh, studying, uh, uh, you know, machines that want to take over the world, like the Terminator. What do we call that? Uh, AI. AI, exactly. For for the AI, for the AI people, or those the the uh, Boston Dynamics making those creepy robots that that you know skulk around and can do backflips and stuff. Now that research has tremendous you know, implications in terms of how it's going to affect people. And so when we look at axiology, can theory be value free? It's not so much can it, it's, it's more like to what extent is your research value free or not value free when we're talking about axiology? And do scholars influence the outcome of the topic being studied? We also know that, let's say with, with CEOs and corporate social responsibility, the research says that the majority of CEOs pick topics of corporate social responsibility that have some resonance with them personally. Many of them pick it because they have autistic children or someone in the family gets cancer or something else. It's not because they sat back and did some sort of calculus and said, this is the best for our organization. It's often because it has a personal tie to the person. And then this last question, are scholars ends? Are scholars expected to generate knowledge or is it enough to simply generate, or are they supposed to generate change? There's this sense that if you know, we're not solving a problem, we're not doing something important, the critique of pure science as being unimportant because we you know, don't resolve issues. But you know, we send people to the moon and in the first visit to the moon, we invented Velcro, we invented Tang, which I mean, Tang was enough, you could have stopped at Tang, but Velcro, you know, and so there are solutions that we find that we don't know what they are, you know, the, the um, you know, the ubiquitous space pen, if you remember that, that you know, we'll write upside down in space and everything else. Well, there are different technologies we invent and at the time we don't know what they'll do for us. You know, sticky notes, where it was basically a bad batch of glue. And they said, well, we made a lot of it. Is there something we can do with it? And you know, 3M thought about it and put some, you know, put some people on it and they 
realized we could put this on stuff and it will come off again. And so there's this sense that, you know, among some that research has to be for some purpose or it's not worth doing. But there's another sense that that's not why we do it. We don't do it because we're solving a problem. So these are axiological questions. And I'm sorry, can you please explain a little bit um, on the question, ontology question, is human behavior best understood in terms of states or traits? I guess I'm not just grabbing a little bit like the, what's, what's, it, what's it about? Yeah, so it's, um, uh, it's the idea of, of biology versus, uh, you know, culture, that are we born with some sort of behavior? So there is some evidence that people are, um, people can be born with certain kinds of behaviors because of, of things. So we know that, we know that uh, evolution doesn't take place over one generation, but we also know that there are certain kinds of people who live in stressful situations, pass on certain kinds of genetic markers to their children to make them more predisposed to respond a certain way to stressful situations. And so um, the sense among some is that there are things that are simply beyond our control. We're born with certain behaviors, certain beliefs, and that's a position that some people hold. But then other people would argue that no, it's about the culture and your experiences and your upbringing and how you were raised. And so that's your classic, you know, biology versus, um, you know, socialization argument there. And right. from an ontological standpoint, the question is, is it something, you know, is the, uh, do we see the world the way we do because of the experience that we had or because of the way we thought about the experience? And um, for some, it's about the experiencing something leads you to some new insight. And without the experience, you're not going to just read about it and understand it. So it, it depends on the theory. It depends on what you're trying to achieve. But that's, does that help? Yes, yes, yes. It is very clear. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay. And actually, if you know, I know many of you know me, but I mean, obviously, feel free to jump in if you want to ask a question or, or stop me or follow up. But I actually have no problem with that. That's not going to throw me off. So let's go to this question here. What is a theory? I was actually going to leave with this, but I decided to put it off for a little bit. So what's a theory? We're here discussing theory. All of you, every single person in here undoubtedly has had to use a theory in a dissertation or a thesis or in an article. So what's a theory? I'm happy to answer. A theory is a, a, at least how I explain it to my undergraduates. It's a, a map for explaining phenomenon in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. So map for explaining. That one map for explaining phenomena. All right, what else? Um, a set of uh, concepts and uh, the relationship among those concepts. Okay, concepts and relationships among them uh, in regard to the, the theory we're studying or the concept that we're studying, I'm assuming you're saying, right? Okay, what else? I think it's a set of pre, uh, assumptions and the propositions. Okay, assumptions and propositions. Any others? I was going to say something similar to Mitchell, but I was going to also say that it's a potential explanation for a phenomenon that's not necessarily set in stone. Yeah, and, and of course we were taught about uh, the Occam, Occam's razor, and we're taught about the idea that theories can be should be disproven, you know, should be able to be disproven, that we have to construct theories in a way that we can test them, and so there is that sense about it. Now, I, I we could spend probably an hour on definitions, but I grabbed the one from Little John Foss. Um, I have a copy of the Little John Foss electronic. I have no idea why or how or where I got it. I, I just know I didn't get it illegally. But I've got the whole PDF of the 2017 edition. So I'm just using that because it's easy. I can cut and paste from it really effectively. So I just pulled this quickly from that chapter. That chapter, chapter one in Little John, is changed every year. So the rule of thumb is if you write a revision of a textbook, you have to change it 10% at least to make it viable. To And usually they add a new chapter or they restructure it. Uh, but this particular chapter hasn't changed a lot, I don't think, in probably 30 years. So I don't think it matters which version of the text you're reading, you'll find something similar. But they say, right, theories have four features, four dimensions, philosophical assumptions or basic beliefs that underlie the theory. 
uh, concepts or building blocks of the theory, explanations or dynamic connections, and principle or guidelines for action. So, you know, basically the theory has this coherent set of ideas that help, you know, guide us about making decisions about things or help us understand things. And often we think of it as um, theories as a way to um, control things. By having a theory, we can make better decisions and we can predict things to try to have a sense of what someone's likely to do. So prediction and control is one of those things we often attribute to theories. But basically, this is the gist of it, right? So on the one hand, it's not that complicated. It's sort of a list of principles that go into it. And so let's look at some of those approaches for a second. There are different approaches to thinking about theory. And um, one of, uh, this is sort of the top ones, right? Or, there are many, but right, experiential learning. There's uh, an approach basically that suggests that we talked about this earlier. How do we know things? That our experience teaches us things. When we do things, we learn from it. So you get sent to summer camp as a kid or something like that. And you have to spend the summer with a bunch of strangers for the first time away from home, which to be honest, I never had. Uh, I lived in the middle of nowhere in Alaska, so your parents didn't need to send you away to summer camp. But that's certainly a traumatic experience for many kids. It's sort of the first time away from home, away from their parents. Our college students experience that. And from that, they learn different kinds of things. They learn that you know their, their moms did all their laundry for them and cooked for them, and now they have to figure out what to do. Or their dads might have, because I do a lot of cooking in my house. But you've got experiential learning as one way, uh, one approach to theory. Then we've got what, what are called common sense theories. So theories that are based on sort of experience and understanding. So a common sense theory, um, uh, what's the age? I was the same time having. Okay, so common sense theory. It basically, um, you know, we have concepts, for example, of time, and physicists will talk about time, and we know that as we approach black holes, time slows down, right? There's all these sort of official senses of time, but there are also these cultural senses of time. We've got monochronic time and polychronic time, and we've got the sense that like when you're waiting for something that, that could be really important, you know, a five minute wait for something can seem like an hour. So we have these common sense theories that emerge about different things in the world that are just basically based on our experiences with them. And then we have a branch called lay theories. And lay theories are sort of, a lot of those are like the things your parents told you. You know, like a couple of these down here. Like if you go out with wet hair, you can catch a cold, which was something my parents always told me. And I never believed that. You know, I'll wear a hat, you know, so it won't really matter. But my mother used to tell me, you know, like if mayonnaise, if you heat mayonnaise up, you'll, you'll kill yourself. I'm like, well, why? Because if it, you know, if it gets warm, it'll, you know, bacteria will grow. I'm like, well, that's great. But microwaving my sandwich isn't going to kill me. Trust me, it's fine. I've done it lots of times, right? But the lay theory can, just comes from something that emerges that then gets passed along to somebody else. And you can study lay theories. It's not that there's anything wrong with lay theories. They aren't necessarily as precise, but we've got lay theories. We've got normative theory. And normative theories, as we think we know in public relations, we've talked for years about normative theories and positive theory. Normative theory, are when we talk about things that, um, how they should be, um, the ethical approaches to things and, and looking towards the future. So normative theories try to guide us, try to tell us what we should do, how to be a better person, how to be a better you know, husband, how to be a better parent, how to be a better speaker. Normative theories give us guidelines for that. Then positive theories, which we, again, we probably are quite familiar with, positive theories are about how things are done in actual practice. So in actual practice, people aren't necessarily um, as sensitive as they should be to other people's feelings, or they aren't as empathetic maybe as they should be. But in a normative theory, we might say you should be really concerned, you should treat your employees kindly, you should be good to other people. And so normative, and it's not that positive theories don't care, it's just that positive theories about what goes on, what goes on in the real world when I, you know, when I look at this. And then we've got the one we all know. You, you may not be familiar with the term if you haven't read a theory book recently. I don't, I don't ever remember learning about nomothetic theory as an undergraduate, but basically your standard scientific theory, okay? Nomothetic theory is based on four propositions, right? We develop a question, we form a hypothesis, we test the hypothesis, and then we formulate theory. And I've not said here, notice where the theory development comes in. We don't start with a theory from nothing. You know, we don't propose a theory to solve a problem and then test it, which is why theory pieces don't typically really don't originally, sometimes people incorporate, but you don't have studies with your theory piece to prove your theories right. Theory proposes something, somebody else tests it. 
somebody else needs a theory, you know, or they develop a question, they form a hypothesis, they test it, then they formulate some sort of theory, and then other people will test that theory and see if it holds up and try to make the theory better. And basically, I'd say most of what I'm focusing on is that point at which we have a theory and we're trying to make it better, or that point at which we've studied a lot of stuff and we don't yet have a theory for it. That's where you know, for my take, that's where theory really is, is more interesting. I'm less excited about, I've got a theory, I'm gonna study Kenton Taylor's five principles of dialogue to see if this website is dialogic. You know, that's great, I get some sites for it, but it's not a very interesting study because lots of other people have done that. So for me personally, I get excited by the theory part of it. All right, so what I did here, I'm gonna show you this because I'm going to have you um, think through this in a, in a couple minutes here. I applied the um, ontology, epistemology, axiology to nomothetic theory and to practical theory, which is sort of applied theory. And so if you look at the principles here, right? So basic, you know, science, traditional science theory, epistemologically, okay? Empiricist and rational, reality is outside of others and discoverable. So from the scientific standpoint, we can see things, we can observe things, we can count things, we can identify things, they exist as something real. In terms of axiology, it's value neutral. Science wants to pretend that th what they do doesn't have any ethical implications. People can use it ethically or unethically. And that's true, but we, as we discussed, it's also not true because there are evil scientists. Far too many scientists have PhDs. If you've seen Austin Powers, you, you know about that relationship. And so um, we've got axiological assumptions that basically say that it's sort of value free. And then ontology, experience, right? Be behaviors determined by and a response to one's biology. So um, there is this sense that ontology, that the way we experience the world is based on what's in our head. And it's not necessarily based on the, the, the experience we're put into, that it's how we make sense of that, that that is often looked at. Now there's, keep in mind for any of these, there's obviously a range of, of different theories and approaches to them, so there's not an absolute. And there's some concepts that are part of that, right? That to, to do this, we, we operationalize things. We have to be able to find a way to measure things. We have to find a way to be able to quantify things. So we use some sort of mathematical formula or we create a scale and then we measure things. Typically two things matter. This is in, like I said, this is all in Little John. If you want more details, they do have a you know, nice discussion of it in there, but validity and reliability. Those are the two questions we know we were told about and we had to worry about was um, uh, validity and reliability. And so is it valid and is it reliable and can we replicate it? And are we finding what we think we're finding and th those kinds of questions. And then explanations tend to be um, causal in nomothetic theory. This caused that. Because this happened, this resulted. So that's our basic, if we apply those. Now we can apply those to any theory, but let's look at um, the, the other approach, practical theory, right? Practical theory tries to capture the differences among situations and provide explanations of understandings. We assume the following. Action is voluntary. Knowledge is created socially. Theories are historical and theories affect the reality we're covering, and theories and values, theories are value-laden, not neutral, okay? And so that is your practical theory, which is makes different assumptions about the world. One is that it's sort of objective and out there, and the other is that it isn't objective and out there. It has to do with what we do. So if we look at our assumptions, right, epistemologically, people take an active role in creating knowledge. Knowledge is created by people. It's created by us. It's created by culture. It's created by interactions. That's the assumption. Uh, and then ontologically, individuals are goal-directed, individuals are goal-direct, have meanings, have intentions, make real choices. So from an ontological standpoint, uh, things are not happening that we can't control. You know, there isn't an objective reality out there that we just, you know, there is a free will that we have control over decisions that we make. We'll make bad decisions and good decisions. So you've got all of these things about um, making real choices and behaving in deliberate ways, et cetera. And then axiologically, Many practical theories are descriptive, but many are also critical. Axiologically, in terms of the, the uh, good and bad, right and wrongness of what we do, there are approaches that say things are good and we should do them, and there are approaches that say these things are bad and we shouldn't do them. And that's part of the theory, is the, this judgment about behavior and this judgment about what people should do. All right, so uh, some concepts that are part of that, right? Actions and behaviors are contingent. 
So um, theoretical concepts acts as a kind of organizing framework so that um, what we do, like I said, isn't absolute and what other people do can be because of what we did. We have an influence on reality. This concept that, you know, we assume that communication is socially constructed and in public relations, I'm always trying to explain to my students that we create reality. If our organization takes a stance on some position and, and it becomes something we start talking about in the social realm, you know, the mass media, we have had an influence on that thing. We've done it. It was us. And so we have this uh, sense that we are, what we do is contingent. Explanations are guided to achieve future goals by following social rules or norms so that um, we have a range of communication behaviors that we can enact and we have a range of things that we can do. But there is a sense that Again, it's because of human agency and because of interactions. And then principles. Practical theories have assumptions or principles, but not all theories do. So this is where it depends what you're studying. There's less of a sense that there's an absolute reality out there, but that doesn't mean you can't. So if you think of something like uh, cluster analysis, okay, cluster analysis is seen by many as a quantitative methodology. And, and Burke refers to cluster agon analysis as quantitative, as a quantitative method cluster analysis in a Burkean sense is in no way quantitative. He wants to say it is because he counts stuff. Uh, and when I read a Russian count stuff <laughs> in quantitative. But uh, in general, you can study things, relationships, and count them. And it's not about how many there are. It's just a tool to help you understand a relationship better. But you can also count things and study words that people use and attribute meaning to those words in a very quantitative way. So when we talk about principles that are part of the you know, philosophical or the uh, practical theory, it varies widely, okay? So it's not simply just the op mirror opposite of, uh, of sort of nomothetic theory of, of standard science, but the point is just that it's a different body of beliefs. All right, so um, we're gonna go to the fun part here in just a second. Uh, theory building in general, right? Most fields have multiple, sometimes competing, sometimes complementary theories. This is something I think a lot of people don't understand about theory, don't want to accept about theory, and don't really appreciate about theory, is that in almost every field, there are many theories to explain things. Now, there are hundreds of communication theories, but if we break them down and say there are interpersonal theories of communication, and then there are group theories of communication, and then there are um, or organizational theories, and then there are public communication theories. And then if we break those down into categories, it's easy to sort of see it as I'm studying initial interaction and that's what I'm studying, you know, and not sort of see that I'm studying interpersonal communication when I study an initial interaction, let's say. And so um, in most fields, there are multiple theories and in many they're irreconcilable. And they know that, and, it's, and in some cases it is a big deal, and in some cases it isn't. So in the case of physics, you know, quantum theory um, isn't, you know, reconcilable yet with our existing theories. And string theory um, may explain the world, but it may not explain the world. We still haven't decided on that. So uh, the sense that a theory has to be um, the one theory is not something that most fields accept. The desire to create grand theory is present in some fields, but not in others. There are people, like I said, that guy at the conference I sat next to, and I don't know who that is, but I'm not going to mention his name. But uh, there are people who think that one theory, we can find one theory that will explain everything. And I've been told by a dozen people over the years, excellence theory applies in every country, it works everywhere. And I don't buy that. And there are lots of people who reject that, but there are lots of people who believe that. And they would like it if there was only the one theory. If we didn't have all these other theories cluttering things up, all we need is the one. So there is this move by some for grand theory, and I'm not judging it. I'm saying people, people, some people want that, some people don't want that. All right, some theorists see theories as local tools rather than global tools. So um, there are those who see, so in my work on dialogue, I never said, and I don't think anybody else who's written about dialogue has said, dialogue is a theory that works in all public relations. Everyone who's written about it, you know, from a theory standpoint, has consistently said dialogue has a range of applications. It can be useful here, but not necessarily everywhere. Um, but there are tools. And I think that's true, again, in most fields, there are different kinds of theories about things that help us understand the world. There are big theories. You know, you can have a big theory, a grand theory that tries to explain the whole field. So the basic Weaver, uh, Shannon Weaver communication model, right? It, sender, receiver, input, output, throughput, environment, context, right? That, that nine part model that every undergraduate probably learned. 
Um, that's a big picture model. There's nothing wrong with it. That's how communication works, standing back, you know, at a thousand feet looking at it. But uh, on the micro level, face to face, that's not how communication works. Because if I'm nervous about you because you're my supervisor, I might not respond to your comment. I might keep silent. And so power comes into play and status comes into play. Hierarchy comes into play. Gender comes into play. So that issue of, um, you know, that uh, some theories are global and some are local. It doesn't make the local ones better or the global ones better. It's not about better or worse. It's about what is it you're, try you're trying to understand. All right, then some theories accept that things are different at different scales or positions. And that's more or less what I was just describing is that some theories are about interpersonal interactions and that's it. Whereas others are about group interactions and that's what they're covering. And then most theories don't spend a lot of time defining or unpacking philosophical assumptions. If you think about most of the articles that you read, I will say in particular in our field, because I know it best. Um, I did a table recently where I looked at some different studies and it's, actually Maureen and I had this from a piece from years ago. It's quite common that people have uh, articles studying things with no theory talked about in it. They might say, this is about dialogue and there's no discussion of dialogic theory at all. It's just assumed that everyone agrees on what dialogue is, that dialogue means something that everyone knows and they're studying that thing. So there is this, um, moved by many that once a theory becomes well enough known and shrined if you're going to study um, you know scct or something that you know everyone knows what it is you know i don't have to spend time discussing it everyone knows what it is it's in tim coombs's you know chapter go read tim coombs it's right there so there's this um ignoring of a lot of assumptions sometimes all right here's what i want you to do i want everybody to pick a theory they don't all have to be different theories you could share, but I want you all to think about it. You can come a different one. It doesn't have to be from this list. I just threw some out here and there's some you know, disagreement from um, certain people about whether things should be on this list. Um, renewal, I made a framework for certain people, namely Martin Taylor. Uh, but uh, I want you to have a set of concepts that maybe you've used, maybe you are uh, familiar with, and, and sort of just pick it, right? Pick your theory, whatever it happens to be that you want to use. And I want to move on with us then sort of unpacking these. I want you to unpack it for us. And you're not going to like this part. So what are the basic assumptions of the theory? This is what I'm going to ask you. And we're going to look back, okay? Ontology, epistemology, axiology. I want you to take your theory and we'll go through them each one at a time because I couldn't think of any way to do this except to make like a handout and send it to everybody. So I'm gonna skip back and we'll do first epistemology, it's top of the list, then we'll do ontology, then we'll do axiology. And I want you to basically identify the assumptions. What are the epistemological assumptions of your theory? What are the axiological, what are the ontological? So if we come back here to um, the original list, okay? Epistemology, I'll give you a couple minutes, um, write some stuff down, and then we'll move on. You can see epistemology on top. Actually, I can probably make this small enough. Can everybody read that? Is that going to be, an, that might be too small. So I'll move it up. I'll make it big and I'll just move it up here in a minute or so. So do, a, do epistemology first, then uh, start working on ontology, and then I'll slide it up and you can do the other two. And I, and I want to talk through this with you and see. So you're not just making a list. I want you to you know, jump in and participate.
if you need me to go back, let me know. I'm just going to try to slide it up so you can see the rest. Okay, so how you doing? We got it? You ready to talk about it? Yeah, I got it. From screen one, who have their videos on, <laughs> I got some thumbs up and some head nods. So uh, let's go ahead and take a second. So let's start about epistemology. What's your theory? Start me out. Give me a theory first. So anybody who did it, we can talk about. So first theory. Mitchell, what's your theory? I did the fully functioning society theory from Heath. Okay. Who else did the FFST? Anybody else? Me. Me. Okay. All right. So to you. So what are the uh, what are the epistemological assumptions of it? The epistemological. Oh. Sorry. Did you did you want to go first, or did you want me to go first? You go first, please. Okay, so um, the, some of the epistemological assumptions are that it, uh, it can be tested. Uh, it is compatible with scientific questions uh, regarding uh, outcomes and consequences. Motives can be identified uh, in practitioners and the theory provides a framework for judging whether or not those are good or bad in a normative sense, uh, underlined by, you know, assumptions regarding collective goods as opposed to individual profit motive outcomes, you know, the communitas versus the corporatus. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I wrote down for epistemology. Okay, mm -hmm. she got um, Aligned with what uh, Michelle said, um, knowledge is, uh, is not explicit, it is implicit and uh, embedded in our public's um, interest and needs. So the way we can gain this knowledge is through engagement, dialogue, and interaction. Okay, good. Maureen Taylor, I saw your blink on, maybe just because you're not muted, were you going to say anything? No, I was just laughing. It's just like, uh, it's just like, uh, here we go. I'm sorry. I was on mute, of course. I was laughing because it's just like class where you, where you ask them, what's epistemology? And everyone's like, ah. Uh. It's just theologies. People just get nervous around the words, but I think both of them hit it. Okay, good. Yeah, I mean, so now let's contrast this. Give me another theory. Who's got uh, a theory that has different assumptions? What other theory we've got? Um, I talked about contingency theory. Okay. So um, 
we're, we're basing our knowledge really on practitioner experience um, and, and everything is situational. There isn't no, there isn't one correct way to do something. Um, and so to me, that's a, a very different perspective than, than any of the, right, the, the normative approaches like FFST. Um, ontologically, right, you have to assume that public relations is constantly changing, that uh, uh, the environments for organizations are constantly changing, and that the, the right answers and meanings are always going to be negotiated. And, but at the same time, the, the theory is still focused on the organization. Right, so the organization's still at the center of making those decisions, even though they're dependent on everything going on around it. Um, and I think axiologically, it sort of uh, empowers the practitioner more than some of the other theories, right? So it's putting uh, uh, the, the decision-making power in their hands, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and so it values their perspective, I think, a lot more than some of the other theories do. Okay. Anybody else have that? Anybody else have the same uh, take contingency? Any other uh, additions to contingency? Okay. Not everybody wants, you know, we, should, we have to be civil. All right, give me one more. What do you got, Prue? Did you pick one, a different one? I did, I did one that wasn't on the list. I did positioning theory. Okay, good. Um, and I said that positioning theory, the epistemology is a, it's seeped in a social constructionist epistemology. So things exist, but we only know those things through our experience with them. Um, and that meaning is co-created is what I've kind of basically said for the epistemology there. Okay. Uh, now, I, we didn't go to, into ontology and axiology for the, uh, for the first theory, the fully functioning society theory. Do you want to uh, throw this out real quick, either one of you? Yeah, look, I did write down a little bit more there, but um, so, you know, something, it's, it's just to do really about, um, there's assumptions made regarding uh, structure versus agency. Um, there's an emphasis on the collectivist and, and the social as opposed to the corporate in its ethics and its underlying norms. Uh, so the theory is therefore not value free. And I would argue that theories can't be value free. So it's consistent with that. Um, okay. Shima, did you have anything else to add? Yes, in terms of ontology, I would say um, knowledge or communication is social and contextual. Um, and in terms of axiology, I would say um, um, it is, that the theory is not value free and the values depends on, our values depends on uh, values of our publics. Okay, now, I'm not gonna try to, oh wait, we got a hand up. Uh, Josh, Josh, Jos, Jos, Bartels? Uh, oh. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's me. Uh, good morning. Um, sorry, I, I had this hand up uh, uh, before this discussion. So it, 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 it was actually, I had at that time, now I have some other questions again. Uh, that's what happens when I'm listening. Um, I, I had one question on the theories and the hundreds of theories is what's your take on the idea that sometimes people call it a theory too quickly. Mm -hmm. So I, what I see, especially in communication science, what I've been, been experiencing in the last 15 years that I read a paper and then everything is called a theory. And I was thinking, what is your thought on that? So that was a general question. And now I have a question on SSCCT, but that's a different question. Okay. Well, I can answer the first one, I think, pretty easily. I'll, I'll give two answers. When I teach comm theory and I get to go back through a book like Little John or whoever you're using, and I get reminded about all this, because none of us can remember and know all the theories. There are so many of them. And uh, you know, sometimes we'll come across one and be like, oh, I've forgotten about that theory. That's a good theory. We should think about that more. Um, so on the one hand, I think I, I am sort of a a Protestant about this, okay? I think the more theories, the better, that theories can help us go farther. But at the same time, I do agree with you. you. You'll see people making claims about things and saying this is a theory and it doesn't yet 
meet meet the bar, meet the threshold. And I think but for me, the problem is just if you don't justify it. Like, I don't have a problem with you making the claim if you want to support it. But it's when someone will make a claim. And like I said, they'll say, I'm studying dialogue and there'll be no discussion of dialogue. I'm studying you know, whatever, engagement, and there's no discussion of engagement, that I start getting annoyed because there's all these assumptions that they're ignoring. So I would say I'm less concerned about there being too many theories than that they're not justifying their use of the concepts. Okay, thanks. Sure. All right, so I guess uh, I'm not trying to make any profound point with this, but I would point out two things here is that on the first, there's a lot of subtleties that go into most of these things that we usually don't think about. When we start thinking about just let's say axiology, I think, which a lot of us ignore, theories assume certain kinds of things. Theories have baggage. Even the most you know, scientific theories have certain kinds of baggage and certain kinds of assumptions about the world. And those are legitimate questions for us to ask and want answers to, or to have to justify if we're gonna use that theory. So I would say first off is, there's an old, uh, first, it's sort of an old joke that one of Maureen's colleagues used to tell us that I've heard many times before. Jack Grosso um, used to say that if you're in a meeting and you're sort of not paying attention and somebody says, uh, uh, Kim, what do you think? You, you, and you're caught off you know, guard. What you can say is, let's look at what the mission says. And I think that's what the ologies are. The ologies are turning back to the mission. Let's, let's look at what the mission says. The mission says our job is to do this. Are we meeting the mission? I think that move of turning back to the um, philosophical assumptions of our theories is something we actually need to do a little bit more of is recognizing that, um, you know, that maybe this is an ontological issue that the theory should be clearer about, or maybe this is an axiological issue that the theory has ignored and we need clarification. And hopefully if I, let me see if I can get back to where I prefer, where before. Uh, contingency theories, if I did it right, we're coming into, ah, that's exactly where I wanted to be. We're coming into this next point, which is about um, what is criticism about? Because in many ways, theory building comes from criticism. We look at a theory. This is the definition I've always liked the best that I, when I was an undergraduate, I had a professor, Bill Nostein, William Nostein in Oregon, and he had this in his handouts and his notes. I did a Google search a couple of days ago to see if this was anywhere online and it's not, which uh, isn't surprising because it was his, but it was from his, his syllabus. And he defined criticism as um, rhetorical criticism. It was a rhetoric class, rhetorical criticism. It extends, refines, or clarifies theory, criticism, or practice. And I've always liked this definition. This is how I think about what, what theory building is about. It can extend, refine, or clarify. So a theory, when we build theory, we can take a theory that exists and take it further. We can extend it. Or we can take a theory that exists and we can clarify a concept from it, a relationship. Um, or we can refine it. We can find a way to measure something better. And I think that's probably the most common move that we see with a lot of theories is we're gonna to try to find a better way to, quanti to quantify what we're studying, especially with nomothetic theories. And we wanna find a way to you know, reduce the variables that we have to study. And that's fine, but that's theory building. And then uh, rhetorical criticism can refer to theory, criticism, or practice. And so in this case, we're talking about theory. But uh, this is, I think, one of the, what I'm saying is the three ologies sort of prep us for realizing there are more questions to ask. And then when we realize what is the purpose of theory building, we see that it's not that every theory is trying to come up with something no one's ever said before. A great many good pieces help us understand the theory better. They take us farther. And so that's, I think, the mindset I want us to think about. So when we look at basic communication concepts, the, the Little John chapter starts by defining everything. And when we start by defining things, public relations theory, right? There's lots of definitions of what public relations theory is. And like we just saw with our different theories and our different um, philosophical assumptions, it matters which theory you're using. If you want to assume that the correct way of defining public relations is about a management tool, then that's going to direct you to look at management functions and management activities and management relationships. If you're going to see it as a relationship building tool, then you're going to look at how people build relationships and the structures of those and the features of those. So 
Uh, the first issue I think for us as theorists to think about is going to be the assumptions of our theory and then also how we're defining communication. What is communication for us? What is the level of analysis that we're going to be focusing on? What is it that we're trying to look at? And like I said in the beginning, uh, everybody doesn't have to want to do theory, but what I think is most people I think feel ill-equipped to do it. They don't think in terms of theory because they think about I'm going to take this and apply it and they don't sit back and say is this the right thing to ask is this the right question to ask is this getting at what I want to know and I think I have it in here elsewhere but I remember when I came to public relations I came from rhetoric and uh, Maureen Taylor was sort of my mentor in what to know for public relations when I started because I, you know, I only took a couple classes that were, you know, in the rhetoric, in the public relations discipline. Um, but I'd started reading the intro texts of the time, the seminal texts, and my response wasn't, oh my God, this is a brilliant theory, I want to study blank with it. My response was, this is Plato. Why hasn't he cited Plato here? This is Aristotle. Does he not know this is Aristotle? Why isn't he citing Aristotle here? And so um, my concern was not with how to use the theory. My concern was why the theory was good. And um, what I was saying is, I think most people don't have that reaction. I know most people don't have that reaction because they don't ask those questions. And I'm not saying you have to ask those questions, but I'm saying as you become more senior people in the field, you should be asking those questions because you have something to give us. As you get to know a theory and you've been using it for many years and you've been studying things for many years, you're gonna see relationships that other people don't see. And I think that's the move we need to start moving towards. So um, Little John has this list, I think this is actually from Dance, this concept of communication. And we know that there are lots of different things we can study, you know, symbols, speech, understanding, processes, you know, linking, stimuli, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of different ways of looking at it. And so I'm not going to you know, privilege one over the other, but just to remind us that even with a, with a sort of you know, tired, know, tired old theory that we have out there, um, we can take them further. I remember again, early when I started as a scholar thinking that, why haven't they done more with excellence? You know, like they spend all their time trying to prove it's right. Why don't they actually start taking the theory further and trying to do more with it? And that's a move I think that a lot of people don't get to is that I've got a theory that works. I've got these five principles of dialogue. Master students are still doing studies using the five principles of, of dialogue. And the first time I saw somebody do it, it was so exciting. You know, someone had written a paper using them, and I got it showed Marie, look, they, they wrote an article about it, you know, and now it's like, really? We know that's wrong. We, the answer is always there's no dialogue for the last 20 years. So that's where we need to push our thinking further. We need to realize that if we're getting that answer, it's probably because we're the, either the theory is not serving our needs or we're asking the wrong questions. And if we shifted our focus to one of the different ologies, or if we set back and examine the underlying assumptions of the theory, we now have a whole basis of things to start exploring farther. They may be there implicitly, but if they're not there explicitly, we should have answers to them. All right, where am I at? Okay, so now at this point, I'm, I'm about, um, you know, we're scheduled to go two hours, about an hour and 15 minutes in. This is where, like I said, I normally would sort of start a class off talking through the articles. I don't want to spend any more time on this than you want to spend. So if you want to talk through this more, we'll take longer. But I thought we could go through the articles, the other three articles that we had, talk through some of the assumptions of those and what they're doing for us. From my perspective, um, that's what I'm looking for. Oops. And may I? Sorry, may I ask a question before we go to the reading? Sure. Uh, have you ever started to work on a theory but failed? Mm, um, it depends. Like Maureen and I wanted to study name changing once because we re realized it was something that was you know, happening a lot. I think after ValueJet had crashed and they, um, ValueJet eventually just changed the name. And so people didn't know they were flying in ValueJet because they have a new name. And um, it's unclear whether they actually done much to fix their, you know, their processes because that was all sort of done secretly. We had, I, I think Maureen asked a master student or maybe an undergraduate to go do a, a check on name change literature and to get all the articles on the subject. And this was a very literal person. And so they literally got like every article on it. And, they, and they, she came back with this 
whole box, like a paper box of articles. There were, I don't know, what's 500 sheets times 10, so like 5,000 5, pages of articles. And I, I started trying to go through it and just gave up and said, this is not possible. Like, I, we can't make sense of 500 articles on this topic. And so I'd say there's been situations like that where we decided it wasn't possible to explore it. Um, I'm, and, and there's been things that were hard to work through. So like I, I've been wanting to work through a dialogic social media network and what would it look like? So creating a dialogic social media tool like Zoom, except not Zoom better. And Fred's been working on it now, I'd say for like five years. And I make slowly, I make progress where I make realizations that will come to me and I'm like, oh, oh, that's a good idea, you know. Uh, but so I'd say, yeah, I mean, you can't just sit down and say, I'm going to invent a new theory or I'm going to fix this broken theory that I don't like. It's a process that your brain has to work on and you have to put in some time thinking about. So I guess the answer is yes, but sort of no, just in the sense that like, I don't, I can't think of like having tried it and given up on it because, it, you know, Fred's still working on stuff. All right, well, there were three articles here, um, two and a half, I guess, one's not an article yet. But um, the first was this piece with uh, Brandon Boatwright that we did on looking at crisis. And this was something that's bothered me for quite some time. I was, and I was actually doing an independent study with Brandon at Tennessee on, um, I think rhetoric, we did an independent study on, on rhetoric so he could take, uh, get the, do the reading on it, talk it through. And one of the things I started doing in every class for the last about five years now is that at the uh, end of every class, we come up with a study using whatever it is that we're reading about that day. So that by the end of the semester, we've sort of conceptualized 10 different studies and it's all individual to the person who's doing it. And it's all sort of based on the theories that we're reading. So it's not about you know, what I want to do, it's about what they want to do. And while we were doing it, talking it through, thinking it through, I realized this would be a great study. I'm going to write this paper. So uh, I came up with the idea behind it. When we were looking at the uh, apologia literature, there's a bunch of concepts, as you know, and scapegoating is one of them. But if you look at the apologia literature, we've got these strategies, right? These are primary strategies attacking the accuser, denial, scapegoating, excuses, justification, compensation, and apology is the very last one. And I always joke that it is the last one. It's usually the last one that people want to use, even though it's the one you should start with. And it's not alphabetical, this list. And so I'm not quite sure how, why you put it together that way, but I always think that that's telling. And then we've got the secondary strategies, right? But almost everything on the strategy is sleazy and unethical. You know, our entire system of how to apologize, our theory of it, the uh, that's been with us for 40 years almost is based on screwing people is based on taking advantage of other people is based on knowing we did something wrong and finding someone else to blame and take the fall for it. So we unpacked this concept of sacrifice of, of ritualistic sacrifice, which is the scapegoating. And so I don't think, you know, we weren't, we didn't build a new theory, but what we did was extend our thinking about this theory, try to refine it. So, um, you know, here, does it extend, refine, or clarify? We basically try to extend crisis a bit by saying that we should be more aware of certain things, but we're also trying to refine and clarify the concept of it. And I've gotten to the point now where I feel like I shouldn't teach this anymore. You know, when I teach crisis, I feel, I tell them, yeah, you shouldn't do that. And I haven't figured out a way to, to sort of teach it and leave out, like maybe I, remove the sections. I use Acrobat to edit out those sections or put a cross through them, you know, before I give upload the articles. But, it, you know, if this is the part of the issue here is if you genuinely believe something is true from, you know, from the ethical standpoint, well, shouldn't we do something about it? And that's a, that's a tough decision. And again, I would say that's why we write theory pieces is because if we think there's something wrong with this, we should talk about it and try to fix it. You can do it in your classroom, but if I'm the only guy doing it in this classroom, how many people are going to learn about that? But if I can put it into an article that, that eventually encourages other people, maybe 10 years from now, the next list comes out and scapegoating is not on that list. We've replaced scapegoating with something else or we've stopped using it. So that first issue about, you know, um, what does it do? And then um, 
the second question, why is it that no one has subjected crisis to scrutiny over the last four decades? So this is my question to you. Why is it that we've had all of these theories going back to you know, Benoit and going back to Warren Lynn Kugel, um, you know, they spoke in defense of themselves. We've had theories for years that are, we know are, are unethical and to some cases immoral, and we've done nothing about them. We've just perpetuated them. Why is that? I think um, uh, our biases is not only because of our disciplinary differences, but even within a discipline, we have biases in our subdiscipline. So there, there have been a lot of um, advancements in um, this stream of research, which, which talks about engagement, dialogue, co-creational strategies, but crisis is another stream of uh, research, which is somehow separate from um, this stream of research. So I think in, in your paper, what you have done is to move between subdisciplines and use progresses in one stream uh, in another stream. Okay. What else? I think all, uh, uh, a lot of the theories about crisis, they are uh, positive theories. So uh, they, they are really rooted in how practitioners are doing. And because most uh, practitioners, they do like, like denial or scapegoating. So uh, if we draw, a practice, uh, draw data from the practice and form the theory, then we will say that uh, they are there are some of the primary crisis mm -hmm. response strategies, but I think I, in the paper in the 2018 paper, uh, it's more of a normative theory perspective how mm -hmm. crisis response should be. Yeah, and actually that's a very good observation. And I would also say that my question is exactly a, a positive theory question, right? And our, uh, you know, or a normative theory question. A positive theorist would never ask that. We use it because it always has been used and it works. And that's literally the answer that's usually given is it works, you know, like that's why we use it, it works. And um, it's not that you would, it's not the question, it's not the question you'd ever ask from a positive theory standpoint. And I, you know, it's just, when we consider that just switching the way we think about a theory completely transforms how we enact it. Mitchell, I have your hand up. Yeah, so my, my uh, question would be, you know, uh, if industry continues to scapegoat, uh, what's the point of removing it from our typologies, right? Because if there's a disconnect between academia and practice, mm -hmm. aren't we just further removing ourselves from the conversation? Unless I, I guess we can improve empirically that the strategy is not worth it. Okay, well, uh, let's, because normally I would start um, pushing this through. So let's explore that for a second, because these are all three good responses. Um, that's, I think, one of the responses that comes back is, it's done. I'm not gonna ask you to go on record answering this question, but if I said to you, have you ever scapegoated somebody, you know, like consciously, I would like to hope that probably most of you haven't, I mean, like, I know my sister used to blame me for stuff that I didn't do, but, you know, like, that's not really the same as having somebody lose their job or having somebody get arrested or having somebody, you know, get whatever. Um, I suspect that the average person doesn't scapegoat as a matter of practice when they're in trouble. And denial, I think, is probably quite a common strategy. And the question always is, what if you didn't do anything wrong? You know, of course, you should be able to deny it. So I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that, but attacking the accuser this is a strategy that's basically used when you, you know, it is used sometimes when you're not guilty, as the research has said, but it's also used when you know you are guilty. And I suspect most of us wouldn't think immediately to attack the accuser if we were, uh, had a problem. So if you look at the strategies as humans, right, as individuals, I think most of them don't resonate with us from a, you know, from a, a normative standpoint, right? But if we look at them as organizations use them, uh, we see that they're still there. Yes. But then you assume that we are normative. Um, yeah. So the, the assumption that, I mean, I, I'm a critical observer of, of uh, this theory uh, because empirically it's, it's very difficult to, I, I, I did at least 
20 experiments in the last five, six years with all my students. And if then you measure, for example, reputation as dependent variable, I get no significant differences between all these different kind of strategies. Um, but if you, and I do agree that we have to question things like why are we still using this? So denial and, and but the, it happens. Uh, I, do, I, I do a lot of research on um, work deviant behavior. Um, mm -hmm. So cyber loafing. Uh, and every time when I also, when I talk to students or even when I talk to colleague professors on, so where does it start? Well, it starts with, so work deviant behavior as employees starts with stealing toilet paper from your office. And everybody's laughing at me. So everybody laughs. No, that's not what people do. People don't steal toilet paper. We know that that happens. And we know that is taking a pen, is that from the office or is taking a copy paper. So, so I do a lot of stuff on work deviant behavior and, 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 and also the cyber loafing, so the online part. And what you then see in all this research, uh, we recently did a research in a merch hospital in the Netherlands and we, even got comments on what, what weird questions are that. So what are these questions? They're weird, which means actually they're not weird, but the people are not honest in answering these questions. So the assumption on attack the accuser and the not, I mean, you have a president that's doing that. Uh, uh, the U S has a president that's doing that all the time. Uh, I, I don't mind. I, I don't, I'm no, don't want to go into politics, but, um, the fact that uh, attack, I mean, it's unethical, right? Uh, yeah. But what you see, at least what I've experienced in a lot of work I've been doing is that uh, ethics is, when it comes to actual behaviors of CEOs, you, they, yes, we, when, from a normative perspective, we want them be, to be ethics. And when you look at research, then morality is one of the things that people find most important. But it's always the argument, well, the other is doing something wrong uh, and I'm not. And then the other one says the, exactly the same thing. So it, it, it's, I think it's, it's, um, the, it's, it's a difficult, I, I think especially it's a difficult uh, from a, I'm an empirical analytic. So just th that you know, so I do a lot of. Yeah. Uh, quantitative research and, uh, and so I come from a specific school uh, I have to be honest about that uh, and on the one hand you could say yeah why are we still using these so scapegoated but it, it if you say well people shouldn't do that then you could say why are we still using it but it it is happening a lot still yeah, although I mean, people are not honest in telling that it's happening and I think the um, part of the problem too is that we want to respond to them by saying, um, but it's going on, why shouldn't we consider it? And I think as you said, the research suggests that they're all sort of equally the same. Most of the studies say that apology is the best general strategy overall, which is what Tim argued last month in his talk, is that the strategy is the best. So if we say as advisors, right, as organizational counselors, we shouldn't be advising these strategies. Um, I think that's a different case than are they used, but you're absolutely right. You know, we, they are used. I think they're used less by individuals, but I don't know if I count Trump as a, as an individual. I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a again, I don't want to get into politics, right? But this is, a, right. A, I, I always use him as an example of, of, of a very interesting public relations case, actually. Uh, and I always try to have my students discuss that. So then one group of the students has to be in favor of one of the, of my statements and one against. And in the beginning, it's very uncomfortable because in the Netherlands, everybody is against him. So it's, <laughs> but it's, it's an interesting discussion. Uh, and it, it's more people and organizations are doing that. Yeah. And I, I guess um, if we, uh, well, I guess the point I'm, I would make is simply that, um, it's not an issue of which theory is right or wrong as well is that is that why don't we have competing theories? I guess is the question I'm trying to pause. Agree. Yep. Why do we have such a, a collection of focus on this um, one set of fairly unethical principles and not 10 different theories of 
of crisis. And we've limited ourselves in that regard. But actually, I think that's a great idea, the, the sort of Pythagorean break them up into two sides of the issue and let them debate it and have to make somebody be pro-Trump. That would be really hard, I suspect. May I add something? Yeah. Um, I think that's from, um, uh, it, it also depends on our values. Um, a base, based on social construction point of view, when, when we theorize about some, something or we teach that theory in textbooks or um, at universities, we actually fold that theory or a strategy and spread it in society. But if we um, introduce, introduce it as a wrong strategy rather than putting it as a a uh, strategy that we may use to succeed. If we introduce it as a wrong strate strategy, uh, well, we cannot um, remove it completely, but we can mm -hmm. um, decrease it to some extent. Yeah, well, actually, uh, it's funny because uh, I proposed doing a chapter for Tim's book, Tim's new book on crisis. And uh, that was one of the things I proposed was questioning all of these questionable theories and doing a broader piece. And Tim did not accept that chapter, <laughs> but which is fine. You know, I have a, a chap, that chapter with Stephanie is, is for his book. But I think um, you're right is, and I, I would say too, is that the theories we have came from somewhere, you know, like we did, we did codify them, but at some point we started teaching them and then we kept teaching them, we kept teaching them, we kept teaching them. And without a contrast, without taking into account, is this a special case or is this, you know, if we don't contextualize them, then we just keep perpetuating them as sort of legitimate strategies to use. Can I just add something too? I think you kind of just hinted at that, Michael, when you said that Timothy didn't accept your proposal. I think there does come like a level of seniority and confidence to question some of these things. And also, I guess this idea of like in academia, like I would even say from, from your papers, the way that you've talked about your papers in, um, in these all these sessions, you seem much more open to the questioning of them than actually just reading the written kind of paper. Like it seems like the way we present journal articles are as if they're very fully formed kind of ideas and we, we definitely think we're right about these ideas. But obviously when we, we talk to academics that we, I guess it presents a different side of things, I think. Yeah, and I think that's also different philosophical assumptions too, because I think we should be questioning any of the theories, you know, like we used to, in rhetoric, when Maureen and I, Maureen has a master's degree in rhetoric, Maureen Taylor, by the way, uh, and uh, we both went to Purdue and we read the Bitzer and Vats, you know, controversial pieces, you know, back in the day with Bitzer writing and then Vats saying he's an idiot and then Bitzer writing and saying Vats is an idiot, you know, figuratively speaking, right? And they went back and forth about three times each. And we sort of always dreamed of that. You know, we used to say, I hope somebody writes a piece telling us we're wrong. And then we can write a piece telling them why they're wrong. You know, we can create one of those, uh, you know, back and forths. And that's a very different way. And I, again, I won't name names, but there are lots of people in the field who do not believe their theories are to be subjected to scrutiny. They believe they're right, they believe they're true, they don't wanna question them, they get angry when people question them. And we, I think, I, I, as, a, as a theorist, I guess, I think that's completely the wrong approach. You know, like a physicist expecting that his theory is not gonna be criticized would be laughed out of the you know, physics academy. You know, they're gonna say, that's not how it works. And yet, all throughout the humanities and social sciences, we have theories that we don't want to question. By the way, nice paper, though. <laughs> so I, I have to get ready. Especially the, surprisingly, there have been few attempts to critique SS, SCCT. That's a, I like that sentence <laughs> a lot. All right, well, thank you. I'm, I'm, uh... I, I mean, I have no problem. I still use this piece because it gives me a nice little list of all the theories and we can use it for class activities to talk about stuff and, and I can use it to question the theories and the approaches. But um, I will say, you know, Tim, one of the things Tim has been doing recently is really trying to um, bolster the SCCT theory. And so he, he supports people writing articles. He, he says, I, I I tutor, I con people contact me all the time and I help them write their pieces and tell them what to do. And I think that's interesting because Maureen and I's approach has sort of been just the opposite. Like we sort of discourage bad research. We don't say, oh, any research is good research. 
not that Tim's taking bad research, just that he really wants to prove that he all, break all the variables down, test them, test them all out, you know, sample all the different things. And that's a different approach, I think, than, um, than saying, let's question the variables. Let's see if the variables work rather than trying to reinforce them. So it really is done both ways. All right, and then the second piece was something uh, I think somewhat similar to that uh, in that uh, um, Lucy had written her uh, dissertation. Actually, she's, a, um, uh, she's, a, uh, she's from China and she studied uh, uh, linguistics. Linguistics, thank you. Start with an L, I couldn't get there for a second. She's a, a linguist and she had studied um, uh, um, various concepts, I guess, some of the same things we were studying. And after a conference, she asked if she could sit down with me and talk to me about her dissertation. And we had a typhoon that day, just as I was supposed to be getting ready to leave the next day. So we were all sheltering underground in this hotel uh, in uh, Hong Kong, I think. And so we sat and had some coffee and talked about our dissertation. And we ended up coming up with a bunch of ideas saying, oh, we should write an article about that. So we ended up coming together talking about this, this concept of um, you know uh, of questioning the theory and trying to extend some theory, and we started writing about this piece. And um, in the process of it, I guess the final piece ended up being very different than the original piece. I think was which, which was much more critical. But we wanted we ended up pushing this idea of normative versus positive theory. And I actually think I find that quite helpful. I think because I, I think most of the time we don't give much thought to which theory camp are we in. And, and we just assumed that what we do was the right approach. And I was always taught, I think we do teach this implicitly, but some people then forget it. We're always taught you use what you need to use to answer your question. So if I need to answer a quantitative question, we're going to use quantitative methods. And if I need to answer a question about what people you know, think or feel or believe, I might need to do interviews or use something qualitative. And there isn't as much of that. So we try to unpack some of that in here, looking at the normative versus you know, positive theory and what does it mean? And so um, the uh, questions I ask here about, you know, what is the premise of uh, the piece? Does it extend, refine, or clarify? I think the same thing I had just argued before about, you know, does it extend? Well, we're trying to um, not necessarily extend in this case, we're trying to refine and clarify practice, theory and practice. And, um, is it normative or positive? I think probably you, you've already guessed that I tend to do mostly normative work. I think that's pretty well known. So uh, I don't have a problem with positive theories. It's just that it's a normative piece. It's questioning the, the approaches that we take. But then why is, why is building theory in social media so hard? This is a question I, I still struggle with because I don't find it easy myself. I've written about it. Maureen and I have written about it recently and I've had some other pieces, but why is it so hard? for us to come up with a theory of social media. There is no theory of social media. There are theories we apply in social media, but we have no theory of social media. Why is that so hard for us? It's kind of strange. I think it's just, it sounds very strange, theory of social media, because social media is, is just a tool. Yes, I mean, people built it, and there is a very big component of, of the role of people in the idea of the social media but it also seems like we don't have a theory of tv you know like we don't have a theory of i don't know do we have a theory of tv or <laughs> but do we have a theory of uh, i don't know radio newspaper a, a, a radio a newspaper i mean we can even go i mean medium is the message and uh, from a clue and everything is basically medium everything that's done by a person so theory of a chair theory of a a pot, you know, I mean, it's just, I don't know, it just sounds strange, theory of social media, um, just sounds strange to me. Maybe this is why it's so difficult. <laughs> well, it is, because I think for that reason, is we just think of it as like this tool of transmitting messages. But you asked a question right there, we do have, we have a whole ton of theories of television, and we've been studying it since the 50s, and we have theories, and if you look at persuasion research, you know, we know that print persuasion works best for certain kinds of messages, whereas television for certain kinds of persuasive messages, television is better, having the face-to-face -face image is better in certain ways. And so we do know that medium, the medium we choose 
media does make a difference in our messaging for things like persuasion and yeah but yeah but it's just not the theory of tv it's the theory of the message and, and the theory of the media effects so it's not the theory of tv per se yeah but it's social media theory is not a theory of computers i mean it's a theory of a medium okay but i'm not gonna i don't want to argue disagree so on the one hand that is absolutely true what you're saying is true is that it is weird to think about it's sort of because it's this tool that we take for granted in many ways and we just think it's sort of a neutral tool and so that's one of the reasons why what are what are other possibilities for why we haven't seen it why don't we have like the so many theories of television why aren't there a hundred theories of social media out there yes i think uh because social media is constantly changing yeah it changes so fast uh -huh. for example when uh, Google Plus was launched, people thought it will become popular, and all of a sudden, you know, it disappeared in uh, 2019, uh, last year. So because it's constantly changing, it's very difficult to find the norms. Thank you. Yeah, I heard your voice, Mingyi. I hadn't heard you in a while, and I thought, I know who that is. <laughs> I, had yeah. to, I had to check. So, um, yeah, okay, because okay. I so, it's, it's weird. I have told a social media class at my university for five years. So every year I need to keep updating my course material. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So maybe like um, you cannot say today's most popular social media will be mm -hmm. popular next year, even next month. Yeah. yeah so okay. for example, I posted my syllabus online for my 4B class and I need to email my program manager and let him know that I need to um, update my syllabus, mm -hmm. change my syllabus. Why? Because I heard maybe US go government is going to ban TikTok and I had TikTok on my syllabus. So then we need to replace this version and he did. So you will never know what's going to happen with a specific social media next month. So because it's constantly changing, so it's difficult to have a social media theory. Thank you. But actually, you just proposed a key principle right there, right? Is that it's a constantly evolving phenomenon, which is not the case so much with TV. TV moves much slower, but like Netflix and other kinds of things have sort of revel cable at the most basic level. And then, you know, streaming services have changed TV. And what you just described is something that I think is a key feature that we would want to consider with social media is this perpetual change, you know, and we had this old phrase, I guess maybe it's not as popular anymore now, but the, you know, like technology moves in dog years. So one year on, you know, one year in social media is like five years in the real world. Yes. That's, that's true. It's true. So you got your first yeah, so, there. yeah. So for my own social media research, I need to borrow technology series. For example, I use TAM, technology acceptance model for my social media marketing research. And I just published an article at GICR. So I think, you know, it's important and that if possible, build social media theory in the near future. Although it's constantly changing, but um, social media is no longer new. So maybe time goes by, we can yeah. see some trends. Thank you. Well, so I mean, reminder, I'll send you a couple articles that we have on the subject that we've worked on, so. Why did you ask the question, uh, Michael? So the so why is building theory and social media so hard? What, what made you come up with this specific question? Um, mostly the way that uh, we constantly see other theories applied where they don't have any acknowledgement of the medium. So, I mean, I'm very McLuhanish about this. I do think the medium is the message. And I do think uh, the choice of using TikTok versus WeChat versus Facebook makes a difference. And one of the things why I teach social media is I teach the students that, um, so how do you be strategic in a medium where you don't know who you're talking to? And you've got sort of a population that may be half women, half men, but you don't really know who. And when you send a message out, it's random. How do we target people? How do we be persuasive? How do we time our messages? And so when we think about the techniques that we use in, in, stand, in sort of old school media, right, in the existing media, we have... We can tell people, you know, calling journalists and finding out they're on deadline and knowing that Friday is a good day to dump stuff that we don't want people to see or whatever. And in social media, the question is, what, what are the principles of social media? 
And my feeling has been that we see almost none of that, that we just treat it as sort of this neutral tool that doesn't have an impact. And I think it really has a much bigger impact than we give it credit for. So that for me was the thing is, we seem to know so little about it, but we use it all the time. It's, you know, and, and you know, undergraduates, when you ask them to come up with campaign strategies, I would say universally 90, you know, 95% at least immediately assume the most common tool will be social media. The best tool will be social media. They don't ask who is my public? What is my, what am I trying to convey to them? You know, they just say, oh, social media. And so that was what drove me to start asking about it. And uh, I think um, to come up with this idea that there is no social media theory per se needs a lot of knowledge because anybody, for example, me as a student, if I want to approach, um, uh, approach it and try to build a social media theory and search the internet Google Scholar, mm -hmm. I will uh, face a lot of papers and textbooks uh, that looks frightening for me. Yeah, and I will uh, say too, this was the hardest article I ever had to get published. And the reviewers kept insisting that there are theories of social media and there are theories that do this already. And then they'd, they'd give us a list of what they were. And when we consulted their sources, it was a book on television or it was a book on mass media. And it wasn't a book on social media. And you know, the word social media appears, you know, 10 times in the book, but it's not a focus on social media. And that was our argument was that we've got all these other theories, but we don't have this. And that's a big, what you say is absolutely true. When you go looking for it, theories of social media, you'll find people testing all, every theory in the world has been tested in social media, but that's not a theory of social media. That's a test of engagement or a test of dialogue or a test of something else crisis strategies, you know, it's not a test of social media theory. It's not a, a development of it. So it is really hard to find. Um, okay, and then let's just hit this last piece and then we can just talk about whatever the hell we want to for the rest of this. This last piece I'd say is an attempt to take crisis a little further. Uh, this is a chapter for Tim's book that we originally had as a conference paper. Uh, Stephanie Mahan and I, I'm not sure if she's still here, but she was here earlier. Are you still here, Stephanie? No, she left. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, and uh, it was her idea, or, um, you know, she's the first author on this. It was her idea to, uh, to come up with this, to look at this, to start questioning sort of the way crisis works in social media. And uh, in the process, we came up with what we thought was a really original, innovative idea. But then when we started doing our research, we discovered that Tim Coombs had already written a piece looking at, um, you know, looking at crisis as well. Uh, and so we had to then try to position this within the three models, you know, sort of we have standard crisis and then we have the um, faux crisis that we were calling it. And then we have paracrisis that Tim had come up with. And so um, we, we come up with a table to try to clarify that. But basically, we are in some ways proposing this as a uh, like, so as Maureen, I told you, we discussed this before. So crisis isn't a theory, right? Crisis is an area. There's a whole bunch of different crisis theories, but crisis itself is an area. We're not saying that you know, social media crisis is a context, but it's not gonna resolve all crisis. But what we're arguing is that in this particular context, there are a set of principles that would apply and here's how we're trying to do it. And we're trying to unpack this. And I'd say, like I said about social media theory, this is part of that whole idea of, of moving in that direction. So we're trying to add to the crisis lexicon. We're trying to take it a little further than just assuming it's a corporate issue that we have to resolve. And I guess the, the for, for me personally, the frustrating thing is always that um, we say, you know, I think Tim started his talk by saying crisis, in, or, in a crisis, organizations are concerned about all their stakeholders and what happens to them. But in practice, I almost never see the concern with all the other stakeholders. It's almost universally a concern with the organization that you see for most crisis situations. And so for me, that was very frustrating. So we wanted to look at, we look at this context of social media crises and whether they're legitimate crises and what makes them different than other crises. And we take, again, a normative approach where we say, look, we can use this as a tool for the organizations to learn. 
Um, if you drag in some of the other contexts, like I've written about the long now before, if we shift our focus from, you know, the bottom line today to saying, what, what are we going to look like 10 years down the road? It might lead us to take a different approach in solving our problem, you know, rather than dismissing it because it's easy to, which is one of the issues I think with, uh, with Tim's idea of the um, a social media crisis that doesn't quite become a crisis, it sort of fizzles. So Tim's idea um, in his model is that either it becomes a real crisis or it isn't, uh, and those sort of not crises then aren't crises, we're arguing that, yeah, they're not crises, but there are social media events or crises that do have impact or that we can give impact to. So we're trying to extend it, right? We're trying to refine it, we're trying to take it farther. In this case, trying to tie it to social media. And then, you know, a couple of questions down here, right? Is, is folk crisis a crisis genre? You can disagree, right? You could say this isn't a crisis. And I think that's to some extent what Tim might argue, but Tim's publishing the chapter so people will get to read it. And do we need a theory or another theory of social media crisis? Which I think is one of the things that I had to think about is do we, don't we have enough crisis theories, you know? Are there, do we need more? Do we have room for more? What do you think? Done after that. So we got 10 minutes, you know, you can ask about that if you want to, you can ask another question if you want to. Um, but I guess let me just do a wrap up and then we'll open up for questions, Mitchell. I would just say that um, hopefully what I'm trying to, what I was trying to convey here through this um, talk was to, I think, give, empower some people who haven't ever given much thought to thinking about theory and seeing that this, this isn't an issue of like some arcane body of knowledge. I mean, you do have to know something. You can't start talking about theory, thinking about theory, writing about theory, till you know the thing pretty well. But once you do, my feeling is that's when you need to start taking us farther as communication scholars. You need to use what you've learned to propose, you know, tweaking, altering, extending, refining, making our theories better. And so um, there's a, a phrase, there's a famous article called the pre-scientific function of rhetorical criticism that used to give rhetorical critics apoplexy when we had to read it for the first time. John Waite Bauer's pre-scientific function of rhetorical criticism, who basically argued that rhetoric's job was to, was to serve science. So we came up with things for scientists to study, but what we thought about was unimportant until science looked at it. And um, Maureen and I recently had been proposing that, that, um, uh, that we can have a, a you know, a pre, uh, the dialogue is essentially a, a, a sorry, I'm lost in one day. That um, uh, that we should have sort of a approach to theory and approach to dialogue that leads us to at, to take the questions farther. Okay, so that it's not pre scientific, but that uh, that science is a precursor to then asking bigger questions rather than that we're serving them. They should also serve us. I think it goes hand in hand and we should ask about both of those things. And so um, I think that's the issue I'm trying to convey is just that you can study a thing your whole career and there's nothing wrong with that and people do that. But I think as we get to know things better, we see things that other people don't see. And that's where I think all of us can contribute to the debates in different areas of taking it further. And I guess that's a big picture. That's about all I got. I lost the point. I'm old when that happens. All right, what do you want, Mitchell? You were about to jump in with something. Oh, look, let me just say thank you first. That was really marvelous and uh, you know, very useful for a, for a book I'm trying to write. So um, very much appreciated. But when you put your proposition to us about, you know, why no theory for social media, I started thinking, well, that, doesn't that come down to, I guess, uh, standpoints? And uh, I started to think of those old terms we used to think about with theories and whether or not they were grand theories or micro theories. So you have the, the macro, the meso and the micro, right? And, and the way I see and the way I've written about social media is thinking about, well, which level of theoretical analysis am I operating in here? So if I'm at the meso level, I'm talking about networks and that type of stuff. If I'm at the macro, the grand, or perhaps I'm talking about political economy, or if I'm at the micro, well, it's messages and, you know, their interpretation. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, to what extent do these categories, the meso, the macro, the micro, still apply when we're developing theories? Do you see them still as useful or, or are they you know, outdated? 
Oh, no, I actually think you have a good point there, which is it really does matter. What it, like we started by saying, right, we've got hundreds of interpersonal theories, organizational theories, public communication theories, and um, those approaches are relevant because sometimes, you you know, I guess uh, one of the things in a, the piece Maureen and I just worked on recently on, on dialogic theory in social media is that there's this um, awareness that a lot of private things go on in social media sites. You know, people talk about problems and people talk about issues and they use it to, to um, self-disclose and they use it to get help. And those are very different settings than the, the public settings that people experience in social media. That's, you know, a private kind of thing where you want to feel safe and you want to feel like someone's not going to threaten you and someone's not going to attack you. And I think that's exactly what you're getting at there is that those are perfectly legitimate is to say, where are we standing on this? Are we looking at how this individual experiences this? And uh, I've never given some thought, but I mean, we could clearly tie this to interpersonal theories in a better way where we might take some interpersonal theories and start talking about how they how they get played out differently in social media contexts which isn't necessarily a theory of social media but it is an extension on an interpersonal theory and how it relates in social media and we could do the same thing with other theories and pull them into that context so that we're not just trying to test that theory but we are legitimately looking at their role in social media so i think they absolutely are relevant Any other questions, issues about the power? I like to have a comment, Ken. Uh huh. Yeah, there is a there is a theory on a social network, social network theory by uh, Castells and Van Dyke that they have uh, arguing each other because because Castell said that. Uh, network society is built because there is a uh, um, social media, but then Van Dyke said that um, social network is already there before the uh, social media exists. They argue each other and um, like really personally, but I think um, there is also um, conventional theory that talking about the network society from the sociologist perspective, right? I like to have your comment on that. And then there's also um, Pantec theory on the uh, social media logic that uh, organization or uh, individual follow the social media logic. So actually they are, um, how do you say, hegemony? Hegemony by the social media logic, because we we follow their rule. We follow the rule of the social media. So when um, when crisis come up, for example, like the Cambridge Analytic, we cannot do anything because we we gave our life to the social media especially the culture such as Indonesia, like people through everything in social media, there is a, a too much, um, you know, self-disclosure become mm -hmm. social disclosure, not only one-on-one, -on -one, but, but to everybody. And then there is also social judgment through social media that people judge each other, especially in uh, the political uh, campaign, in social media, so I think there is a, um, there is a, um, um, how do you say, uh, theories that we can apply in social media case. What do you think about that? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, so there's a lot there, so I'll just sort of kind of go on. I think you're absolutely right, is that I guess I'd rather see us um, applying theories in social media than applying theories in social media pretending that social media has no impact in the relationship. So I think you're absolutely right is that we can take some of these theories and start looking at what they mean. And I think as Min Yi had pointed out, there's this sense that the internet and social media are moving fast, that we have to struggle to keep up. And then as you said, we've got these privacy issues where um, in many places of the world, people do business with their social media, 
you know, like I use WeChat here in Australia and I uh, tell my students they can, you know, join my WeChat network, but I don't do work on WeChat. And for many of them, that's like, why even have WeChat? You know, like I can't, if I can't write you about class, why are we going to have WeChat? Because I want to, you know, keep it as a social media tool, not as a work tool, but all around the world, that's not how it is. People are sort of locked into these tools, these technologies. And that's where I would say the, the thing I think we actually need a little bit more of is understanding that these aren't new technologies. These are old technologies. This is a whole collection of old technologies. You know, email goes back more than 50 years. And um, uh, IRC was one of the early chat groups where people got together and chatted with strangers and stuff like that. So we've got these tools that have actually Rogers, I think, is a better model of thinking about diffusion of innovations and the, the way innovations uh, come together with other kinds of tools to change what we do because they're not new ideas. And then ultimately what I argue, you know, I want my students to learn is this, these are rhetorical. Persuasion is persuasion. You can be persuasive in social media. You can be persuasive interpersonally. Persuasion is probably going to be a lot slower moving over the next 50 years than social media is, you know, since persuasion hasn't changed all that much in the last 2000 years, it's probably not going to make a big change. So I totally agree on that point is just that I think we need to understand better how these things work in social media. And maybe that's what, the social media theory looks like is to say there's a collection of principles that apply in social media. That's a piece I'm working on now with Lucy also again, but um, not, I don't know if there's going to be like here are the 10 principles of social media that apply, but I think there are a whole bunch of things that can apply as, as Mitchell suggested, there's which perspective do we take and uh, you know, and it could be about timeliness or it could be about being strategic or it could be about relational dynamics. So I just think for me, I think there's so many more questions to ask that are not just treating social media like something we don't even need to know about. I don't know if that answered. Any. One more question. Is it okay? Sure. I, I saw Kim unmute herself for a second, but then she muted herself again. So if you want to jump in afterwards, Kim. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, there is a, a theory um, on netnography by Cosinet, uh, but well, the netography is um, is a text analysis actually on how people have a conversation in social media, but they didn't mention about the quality of data, you know, like validity and reliability. What do you think about it? Uh, well, I'm not familiar with it, so it's a it's a ethnographic approach you're saying to the study of yeah ethnography it's Net come from ethnography but in the oh. net yeah yeah uh, well you know um adam saffer and i did a study a while back where we looked at where communication professionals thought the the technologies were going and I think one of the things that was quite commonly known among professionals is there's all of these things we've lost in the in the tool, you know, like the perfumed letter, the, which is something used to be something of a cliche, I think, but we'd see them in movies and someone would take out of a box this letter they received from their, from their you know, wife or their husband or some lover from years past. And so there are certain things we lost that the experience in social media will never have, you know, like we've got all these pictures on our phones that we look at, but we've got emails going back decades. Nobody like flips through their old emails to read their emails. And the love letter has been reduced to an email message. So you don't even have that really to look back at. I, I ended up somehow by accident with these messages from random people on my music tracks. I got one from Maureen that comes up every once in a while where they were saying something like, hey, where are you at? What are you doing? And uh, every time it comes on, I just laugh and I think, oh, you know, look, I had, it's like this, it's something special, right? Like we don't save things like that. So I would say that you're, you're, you're absolutely right, is that we want to, we look at these phenomenon and we sort of look at what's there and we say, this is what we're studying, but there's more to it than that. There's a whole different levels of personal experience of these technologies that we should take into account as well. So I don't know, that's my take on it. Thank you. All right, anybody else want to jump in, ask a question? 18 from our high of, I think 24 or something like that. So. 
All right, well, hopefully this was useful. Hopefully you found it, you know, helpful, interesting. Think about. All right, thank you. So if you're- Really useful, thank you, Michael. All right, good, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Very yeah. useful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, um, I'll wrap it up. I'm going to hit stop on the recording.